All right, welcome back. We are on part 10. Where did the Book of Mormon come from? We want to return to the manuscript that was discovered by Hubbard in the trunk. Um, so the earliest apologists would have us believe that this manuscript was manuscript found. But as we will see, this does not back up their case. So what we want to do is begin with that trunk that was found. And then I'm going to go ahead and skip a little bit further forward, if that's all right. Because um, I think it's uh, very important. So we know that, sorry, I'll just let it read there. So we know that Deepa Hubbard got the manuscript from the trunk, the first manuscript, and delivered it to Edie Howe of the Painesville Telegraph. Here's what Deming had to say in his interview with Edie Howe. In some ways, Hulbert learned of Solomon Spalding, who wrote a fiction at Conduit, Ohio, in 1810 and 11, which he called Manuscript Found. John Spalding, a brother of Solomon, directed him to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where Solomon had taken his manuscript to have it printed. He learned Mrs. Spalding was in Massachusetts, went there, and obtained an order from her to go to Hartwick, New York, for another copy. Hubbard returned to Ohio, lectured about the county on the origin of Mormonism and the Book of Mormon. I heard him lecture in Painesville. He finally came to me to have this evidence he had obtained published. I bargained to pay him in books, which I sent to him at Conuit, Ohio. Before publishing my book, I went to Conuit and saw most of the witnesses who had seen Spalding's manuscript found, and I testified to its identity with the Book of Mormon as published in my book, and was satisfied they were men of intelligence and respectability, and were not mistaken in their statements. I publish only a small part of the statements Hulbert let me have. Among them was a manuscript written by Solomon Spalding, which he called Conuit Story. It was written on or about two choirs of paper and was a romance, romance of Indian wars along the shore of Lake Erie, between various tribes, one of which he called Erie, another Ch 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 Chicago, is now in the possession of a former editor of the Telegraph, Ella Rice of Honolulu. I was not acquainted with Hulbert until he came to me to have his evidence published. He was good-sized, fine-looking, and full of gab, illiterate, and had lectured on many subjects. So then... We go a little bit further. Uh, now, D.P. Hubbard, as you can see here, um, you can see that manuscript story is indeed found on, on that. So, E.D. Howe, what he did was, with the manuscript, is he first, uh, he sold his business to his brother, Azahel Howe, for $600, he became part owner with him. And then it went to Ella Rice and Philander Winchester in 1839. Now there was a fire that took place, and so Howe believed that the first manuscript was destroyed in the fire in 1841. But then what's really interesting is that in Honolulu, Hawaii, where Ella Rice had moved to, in August of 1884, he accidentally found the manuscript, that first manuscript. He was looking for anti-slavery material that he had brought uh, with him. And then uh, L.R. Rice actually had a friend, and that friend uh, is happened to be a president of a college. So Rice turned it over to his friend James Fairchild of Oberlin College, in which, as you can see here, it was delivered to the college. Now, L.R. Rice was writing to Joseph Smith III, uh, and he says, the Spalding manuscript in my possession came into my hands in this wise. In 1839 to 30, my partner and myself bought of E.D. Howe the Painesville Telegraph, pu published at Painesville, Ohio. The transfer of the printing department, ties, press, etc., was accompanied with a large collection of books, manuscripts. This manuscript of Spalding's among the rest. So you see, it has been my possession of over 40 years, but I never examined it, nor knew the character of it until some six or eight months since. The wrapper was marked Manuscript Story, Conuit Creek. The wonder is that in some of my movements I did not destroy or burn it with a large amount of rubbish that had accumulated from time to time. It happened that President Fairchild was here on a visit at the time I discovered the contents of it and was examined by him and others with much curiosity. 
since President Fairchild published the fact of its existence in my possession, I have had applications for it from half a dozen sources, each applicant seeming to think that he or she was entitled to it. Mr. Howe says when he was getting up a book to expose Mormonism as a fraud at an early day, when the Mormons had their headquarters at Kirtland, he obtained it from some source and it was inadvertently transferred with the other effects of his printing office. A.B. Deming of Painesville, who's also getting up some kind of a book, I believe, on Mormonism, wants me to send it to him. This is Dickinson of Boston claiming to be a relative of Spalding and who is getting up a book to show that he was the real author of the Book of Mormon once it. She thinks at least it should be sent to Spalding's daughter, a Mrs. Somebody, but she does not inform me where she lives. Deming says that Howe borrowed it when he was getting up his book and did not return it as he should have done. This manuscript does not purport to be a story of the Indians forming the upcoming this continent, but is a history of the wars between the Indians of Ohio and Kentucky and their progress in civilization. It is certain that this manuscript is not the origin of the Book of Mormon Bible, whatever some other manuscripts may have been. The only similarity between them is in the manner in which each purports to have been found, one in a cave on Conneaut Creek, the other in a hill in Ontario County, New York. There is no identity of names or persons or places, and there is no similar style between them. As I told Mr. Deming, I should as soon think uh, the book of Revelations was written by the author uh, of, and I have a trouble saying this name, uh, so I'm not going to try to say what that last name is of Don, and as that the writer of this manuscript was the author of the Book of Mormon, Deming says Spalding made the three copies of the manuscript found, one of which Sidney Radin stole from a printing office in Pittsburgh. You could possibly tell better than I can what ground there is for such an allegation. As to this manuscript, I cannot see that it can be of any use to anybody except the Mormons. To show that it's not the original of the Mormon Bible, but that would not settle the claim that some other manuscript of Spalding was the original of it. I propose to hold it in my own hands for a while to see if it can not be put to some good use Deming and Howe informed me that its existence is exciting great interest in that region. I am under a tacit, but not a positive pledge to President Fairchild to deposit it eventually in the library of Oberlin College. I shall be free from that pledge when I see an opportunity to put it to a better use. I'll arise. Upon re P.S. Upon re reflection since writing the foregoing, I am of the opinion that no one who reads this manuscript will give credit to the story that Solomon Spalding was in any wise the author of the Book of Mormon. It is unlikely that anyone who wrote so elaborate a work as the Mormon Bible would spend his time in getting up so shallow a story as this, which at best is but a feeble imitation of the other. Finally, I am more than half convinced that this is his only writing of the sort and that any pretense that Spalding was in any sense the author of the other is a sheer fabrication. It was easy for anybody who may have seen this or heard anything of its contents to get up the story that they were identical. Then he wrote another letter to him. I am greatly obliged to you for the information concerning Mormonism in your letters of April 30th and May 2nd. As I am no sense of Mormonite, of course, as a matter of curiosity, Mainly that I am interested in the history of Mormonism. Two things are true concerning this manuscript in my possession. First, it is a genuine writing of Solomon Spalding. And second, it is not the original of the Book of Mormon. My opinion is from all that I have seen and learned that this is the only writing of Spalding, and there is no foundation for the statement of Deming and others that Spalding made another story, more elaborate of which several copies were written, one of which Rigdon stole from a printing office in Pittsburgh, of course, I cannot be as certain of this and the other two points. One theory is that Rigdon or someone else saw this manuscript or heard it read, and from the hints it conveyed, got up the other and more elaborate writing on which the Book of Mormon was founded. Take that for which it is worth. It don't seem to me very likely. You may be at rest as to my putting the manuscript into the possession of anyone who will mutilate it or use it for a bad purpose. I shall have it deposited in the library of Oberlin College in Ohio to be at the disposal for reading of anyone who may wish to peruse it, but not to be removed from that depository. My friend, President Fairchild, may be relied on as security for the safekeeping of it. It will be sent there in July by a friend who is going there to take to himself a wife. Meantime, I have made a literal copy of the entire document, Errors of ortho or Orthography and Grammar. I have had an idea sometimes that it is due to the Mormons to have a copy of it, 
they took interest in it enough to publish it, as is only of interest as showing that it is not the original of the Book of Mormon. No one else is likely to wish it for publication. Mrs. Dixon, whom you call granddaughter Solomon Spotting, represents herself to me as his grand niece. My great uncle, Reverend Solomon Spotting, she writes, Reverend Dr. Hyde, president of the institution in this place for training Native Amer missionaries for Micronesia. A very prominent and successful institution has written an elaborate account of this manuscript and of Mormonism and sent it for publication in the Congregationalists of Boston. I presume it will be published and you will be interested in reading it. Very respectfully, yours, L. L. Rice. James Fairchild's Diary Preached in the morning in the Fort St. Church, contrary to my intention, the preaching had been announced with my knowledge, without my knowledge. A warm day, 80 degrees indeed, every day is warm. At noon, went home with the Whitney's to dinner. Father Rice had been looking over his papers to see what anti-slavery documents he had for our library and came upon an old manuscript story. To have been written by Solomon Spalding, probably the one which had been supposed to be transformation of the Mormon Bible, unquestionably a genuine document. Mr. Rice must have had it forty years, but could not tell how it came to him, but never looked, had utterly forgotten it. I spent an hour looking through it bears no resemblance to the Book of Mormon, except that it is a rambling story of about the same literary merit, manifestly written by men of limited education, but some thought purporting to give the history of the Indians of New York, Kentucky, and Ohio. Their wars, the book would be a gratification to the Mormons as putting an end to the story the other book is a reprint of Solomon Spalding's manuscript. I do not think that they have anything to do with each other. Went to Mr. Castles and stayed with them overnight. And then uh, the Millennial Star, uh, a newspaper that the Latter-day Saints published, says, Dear Sir, we have in our college library an original manuscript of Solomon Spalding, unquestionably genuine. I found it in 1840, 1884 in the hands of Ella Rice of Honolulu, Hawaiian Islands. His formerly state printer at Columbus, Ohio, and before that, publisher of the paper in Painesville, whose preceding publisher had visited Mrs. Spalding and obtained the manuscript from her. It had lain among his old papers 40 years or more, was brought out by my asking him to look up anti-slavery documents among his papers. The manuscript has upon it the signature of several men of Conuit, Ohio, who had heard Spalding read it and knew it to be his. No one can see it and question its genuineness. The manuscript has been printed twice, at least once, by the Mormons of Salt Lake City and once by the Josephite Mormons of Iowa. The Utah Mormons obtained the copy of Mr. Rice at Honolulu, and the Josephites got it of me after it came into my possession. This manuscript is not the original of the Book of Mormon. Yours very truly, James Fairchild. And Theodore Schroeder here says this. Fairchild's last statement. Since this essay was placed in the printer's hands, I am, through the kindness of the uh, Reverend J.D. Nutting, enabled to add the following recent 1900 statement from ex-President Fairchild. With regards to the manuscript of Mr. Spalding now in the library of Oberlin College, I have never tasted, stated and know of no one who can state that it is the only manuscript which Spalding wrote, or that it is certainly the one which has been supposed to be the original of the Book of Mormon. The discovery of this manuscript does not prove that there may not have been another which became the basis of the Book of Mormon. The use which has been made of statements emanating from me as implying the contrary of the above is entirely unwarranted. James Fairchild So, when we look at what's going on here, which we already looked at, now it's very interesting how they, uh, the Mormon Church, when they received uh, received the manuscript, they publish it as manuscript story. You can see it as manuscript found. You can see that in the very title there, the manuscript found or manuscript story. So that was very interesting, you know, that they did that. Now the question comes to being comes to mind is: Did Solomon Spalding write only one manuscript, or did he write more than one? And you have to look at the witnesses and what they said. Look at what Wright says. Spalding had many other manuscripts, which I expect to see when Smith translates his other plates. John Miller. I was soon introduced to the Spalding, manuscript of Spalding. For use him as I often had ledger, he had written two or three books or pamphlets on different subjects. But that which more particularly drew my attention was the one he called the manuscript found. McKinstry. 
Mr. Deming, dear sir, I have read much of the manuscript story, Connie Ware Creek, which you sent me. I know it is not the manuscript found, which contained the words Nephi, Mormon, Moroni, and Lamanite. Lamanites, do the Mormons expect to deceive the public by leaving off the title page, Conuit Creek, and calling it Manuscript Found and Manuscript Story? And then we got Ella Rice. There is no outcome of the quarrel, as the story is evidently unfinished and stops abruptly. Well, this is interesting. Is this a book fit for publication if there is an abrupt ending? To ask us to answer. Heber Howe also says to T.W. Smith, the manuscript you refer to was not marked on the outside or inside manuscript found. It was not the original manuscript found. And this was stated three years before the discovery in 1884. And those are two different titles, my friends. And you can see it here on, on this, uh, on that picture. A letter writes to James Fairchild. The words Solomon Spalding's writings in ink on the wrapper were written by me after I became aware of the contents the words manuscript story, Connie White Creek, and the penciling were as now when it came into my possession. And then Robert Patterson to James Fairchild says this, When so many hearers of the story in different places concur in the recollections of names constantly recurring the story, and when some of them hear it, heard it read again and again, it seems impossible that after 20 years they should confound it with a story, manuscript story in which not one of these familiar and unique names of persons and places did once occur. The memory of people who at that period read or heard very few romances would be all the more tenacious of the few. It might be the only one they did hear. But there is one circumstance that seems to settle the absolute independence of the two manuscripts beyond a doubt. Manuscript story, Connie White Creek, is not sham, hebraistic, but in ordinary English, which he's talking about how and it came to pass, and it came to pass, and you know, written in the style of the King James language. Whereas every witness who heard Spalding read his manuscript found, so far as I now recall, testifies to the fact that in that document he carried his biblical imitation to absurd excess. They laughed at him for it, named him from it. And now, if manuscript story Connie White Creek is the real one to which they listened, it turns out that every one of these witnesses in Ohio and Pennsylvania were utterly at fault. They actually styled him, oh, come to pass, and yet he never used the phrase and then uh, let him believe it who will. When so many hearers of the story in different places concur in the recollections of names constantly recurring in the story, and when some of them heard it read uh, again and again, so, and it seems impossible after 20 years since he found it with the story. So you can see there, friends, Uh, where So he says, uh, contrarian the recollection of names, constantly recurring the story, and when some of them heard it read again and again, it seems impossible that after 20 years that you can find out with the story of manuscript story, which not one of these familiar and unique names of persons and places at once occur. Moreover, it is unitedly testified by these witnesses that before Spalding became a bankrupt, and when he wrote only to while away the hours of his illness without any thought of making money by publishing his book, he his purpose in the story they they heard him read was to show seemingly that our Indians were descended from the ten lost tribes. He therefore started the colonists from Jerusalem. This was the very foundation of the whole fiction. How is it possible that such a story in 20 years became confused in the memory of those who heard it with the story which left the Jews altogether? All the memory of people who at that period read or heard very few romances would be all the more tenacious of the few. It might be the only one they did hear. And then we have E. Brady Howe saying, The trunk referred to by the widow was subsequently examined and found to contain only a single manuscript book in Spalding's handwriting, containing about one quire of paper. This is a romance purporting to have been translated from the Latin, found on 24 rows of parchment in a cave on the banks of the Conuit Creek, but written in a modern style and giving a fabulous account of a ship's being driven upon the American coast. While proceeding from Rome to Britain, a short time previous to the Christian era, this uh, country then being inhabited by the Indians, this old manuscript has been shown to several of the foregoing witnesses who recognize it as Spalding's, he having told them that he had altered his first plan of writing by going farther back with dates and writing in the old scripture style 
in order that it might appear more ancient. They say it bears no resemblance to the manuscript found. Um, and E.D. Howe is wrong about that matter, that it took place in the time of Constantine, actually, in the 300s A.D. So, when we put together a timeline, uh, you could say it this way. 1809, Spalding begins manuscript number one. And then his brother Josiah visits Spalding during the winter of 1811 to 1812. And we know that um, he left the spring, uh, that Spalding left the spring of 1812, carrying, obviously carrying manuscript number one with him. Now he lays manuscript one aside and complete, and uh, that's why, you know, uh, when Mr., I think it was Mr. Harper that was playing cards, and he needed to write something, and his uh, wife of Spalding gave him a paper, and uh, then they sparked up a conversation about, well, this is a, you know, paper used for writing a novel. I mean, why would you give somebody a paper if, if it's basically not being used anymore, right? So it's incomplete um, prior to Pittsburgh, and we know, uh, so it's incomplete because it has an abrupt ending, and I, I have read it myself, and it is, a, there are some very distinctive uh, differences between manuscript story and, and manuscript found. So he starts manuscript number two, wants to go back, uh, you know, further in time, Wants to do it in the old obsolete style, the King James language. Uh, so it's incomplete prior to Pittsburgh, and he he read it to his friends and neighbors. Um, you know, he moves to Pittsburgh with the incomplete manuscript number two, and the autumn of eighteen twelve submits to R. N. J. Patterson for possible publication. Um, he obviously probably dealt with Joseph Patterson and Silas Ingalls more, um, and they told him to you know preface preface it, title page it, but. Maybe Silas Ingalls then said, well, you need to come up with some money for security, but unfortunately, um, Sydney, uh, sorry, uh, um, Spalding was not able to do that. And then in 1814, he returned to Spal uh, It was The manuscript was returned to Spalding prior to Amity. Uh, according to the widow, according to McKee, according to Miller, he works on it more in Amity. The uh, title page, the preface, but sometime in 1815, 1816, he submits manuscript number two again, um, and it turns up missing. Either it was copied by uh, Sidney Rigdon, or it was stolen by him. But we do know that Spalding tells John Miller, his wife, and Cephas Dodd, who the thief was, which was Sidney Rigdon, and then so we see that. Solomon Spalding did die in October of 1816. So, when you think about all the circumstantial evidence that we got, friends, I want you to think about this, if I might. So, when you read the Book of Mormon, especially read read Alma, uh, read read Mosiah and Alma and Helaman uh, and Mormon. You'll find a lot of wars. Oh, and, and Ether. You'll find a lot of these wars mentioned. And that would make sense. Because here, Solomon Spalding, he, he was in the Revolutionary War. So, you know, that would, that would give him some experience to write about some of these things. Secondly, remember that he did spend a little time with Zephaniah Swift in studying law. And... Very interesting enough, when you read the book of Amma, it talks about law and lawyers and stuff of that nature. So you can see how that would help him contribute to writing this story. Thirdly, think about the classes education at, of Dartmouth College. I mean, how much uh, those would help you with names and creativity and just being familiar with those names and stuff. So think about that. Number four. Think about how he was in Conuent, he saw these ancient mounds, and that would spark up an idea in him, hey, I want to write a story about these first inhabitants. 
Number five, think about how he wanted to write in the biblical style. And of course, he being a preacher was familiar with the Bible. He's familiar with the King James Version language. So we could see him, how you might use that and use, and it came to pass. And of course, uh, those who read it or heard it read were saying, man, you're using this too so, so much. We're going to nickname you, Oh, come to pass. So, and that's what they did. Seven, he had the ability to, to write manuscript number one. So we have it. We have an extant. Uh, we have. We do have, you know, a manuscript that he did write. What we call manuscript number one, one manuscript story, Conduit Creek. Now it, it's not as polished as um, manuscript number two is. That's for certain. But you know, in manuscript number one, we see it is about Romans in, Con in Constantine's time who travel, who go to America and. You know, they deliver this record that's hidden in a cave um, on 24 uh, rolls and in Latin, that and the recorder, you know, translates it. But it was never finished. It does have missing pages, and it has an abrupt ending. So it's not fit for publication. So how could that be the manuscript that was submitted to R. J. Patterson firm? So we got manuscript number two, manuscript found. Which is a different title. I mean, that's two distinct titles: manuscript story, manuscript found. R. G. Paris. He submitted to R. J. Patterson in Pittsburgh. Now it ends up missing. That's the important thing, and that makes sense if it's missing because it became the Book of Mormon. That's why. It's from eighteen fourteen to eighteen sixteen, and you even have the Cleveland Advertiser in eighteen thirty one who made the connection between Rigdon and the Book of Mormon. You have Gordon Bennett remember, who wrote about this matter, and he made the connection between Rigdon and the Book of Mormon in August and September of 1831. And then you got Hyde and Smith, and uh, who, you remember, with the Mormon missionaries who traveled to Conuit, Ohio, and Nehemiah King, he made the connection between Spalding and the Book of Mormon, along with, of course, Aaron Wright and others. And that was in February 13th, 1832. Okay, that was about, you know, several months later after the Cleveland Advertiser, and Gordon Bennett. And then you have the summer and autumn of 1833, in which you have, uh, you have as a case that, okay, Holbert, he learns about Spalding's uh, manuscript. So he goes to talk to these witnesses. So he talks to John and Martha Spalding, talks to Oliver Smith, Nahum Howard, Aaron Wright. He talks to Henry Lake. He talks to John Miller. And he talks to Artemis Cunningham. And, we, and he talks to Matilda Davidson, talks to Joseph Miller, talks to Reddick McKee and Matilda McKinnistry, Admir Jackson, Cephas Dodd, George French, Robert Hopper, Daniel Spencer. Uh, is uh, Well, I'm sorry. He didn't. Uh, sorry. Uh, I, I should make mention that uh, only one through eight was Hulbert, the one that talked to them. Um. But, of course, uh, he did take, um, we see that other um, people took down the statements of the ones that are found 9 through 18. And which, very interesting enough, Joseph Miller states it was Rigdon who was suspected of stealing the manuscript. Number 10. Number uh, 11, uh, we see is a case, um, Sorry, I'm trying to think here. George French, secondhand from Cephas Dodd. Rigdon was, had taken the manuscript. And William Leffingwell. Um, so, I believe also, uh, sorry, I meant to put uh, McKee as well. Sorry about that. Uh, he, I don't know why I have McKee there. I should have put Rigdon there. So I apologize for that. But you can see here, how much of the circumstantial evidence fits, friends? I think that's very important when we're putting all of this together. Okay. And you'll remember, um, if I might say this, let me just go back one moment. You'll have, you remember that when when Hubbard returned from New York, came back, came back to Ohio, he came back with the first manuscript. And he said, is this all in Spalding's writing? And Aaron writes, and 
says, no, it's not. It's not the same one. So it's very important for us to, to think about these matters. Well, I really appreciate being with you. And this is only beginning, so I really want you to join us next time as we do some more study on this matter in an upcoming video.